Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Sanford Institute uh, for Empathy and Compassion and another um, segment of our Compassion Beyond Borders series where we get to talk with really remarkable people who've done amazingly powerful things to make our world a better place, who have, have really been uh, the epitome of the empathic and compassionate people, people who've served many, many other people. And, you know, it's our pleasure to be able to meet them and, and learn about them. And so with my co-host, uh, Nyla Chowdhury from UC Extension, Social Impact and Innovation Div uh, Director, I'm happy to, uh, to welcome you to the show. And Nyla, will you introduce our guest? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Mobley. Today's guest is inspiring and awesome Roberta Baskin. She has spent more than 30 years as an award-winning investigative reporter, investigating injustice, especially in corporate misconduct. She has earned 75 journalism awards and multiple Emmys. She sits in many boards, and she has been one of the pioneers of UN Sustainable Development Goal, creating curriculum in almost 80 countries. She has had the honor of receiving 100 Visionary Le Leaders Award by Real Leaders Magazine. She has paved path and shown the true value of human connection and collaboration to create hope, resilience, compassion, and healing, leaving no one behind. Hi, Roberta. It's such a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Nyla. And it's so nice to see you and, and also to um, meet you, Dr. Mobley. Thank you. So we are very eager to hear your amazing life's journey and challenges, which you've had many, your perspective and social impact during the pandemic. Well, I feel very honored to, to be with you. And um, I've really spent so much of my life looking at what's wrong as a reporter. That was sort of my, I was very drawn to injustice and, and things that weren't going well and shining a bright light on those. And in my older years, I, it's almost like a, a Jungian term, turn of wanting to be in the light and wanting to shed light on what works, what the solutions are, um, to find empathy, to find um, the solutions that um, are out there and the kind of untold stories about them. You know, uh, Roberta, we, we think in the Institute about this progression that kind of goes all the way from the beginning, if you will, to peacefulness. So we say, if you want peace, seek justice. If you want justice, seek compassion. If you want compassion, seek empathy. And really your life has been exactly rotating with that sort of sort of series of events because there's been the injustice focus, then the justice focus. And with that, I'm guessing not only that you're promoting peace for others, you're probably promoting peace for yourself. And, and now the compassion and the empathy pieces probably fit in your life in a more powerful way than perhaps when you were uh, younger. Well, it's definitely more holistic to have experienced all sides of that. I mean, I find when um, things go wrong in my life that it does give me more empathy. Also, when something bad happens to me and then I see it happening to somebody else, I understand. I have, I have more compassion around it. I'm not um, confused or, you know, I know what that feels like. Um, I When I did my stories, I always tried to work in who's doing it right. But there really wasn't, uh, you know, the when I worked at the network, especially, the focus was on, okay, so if you, whatever I was exposing, really focused on that and, and not so much, well, look over here at who's doing it right. Um, and and um, I definitely had a longing for, and, and I'm a slow learner sometimes. I would say um, it took me my work in something called Images and Voices of Hope, which has now become the Peace Studio, which I've been involved in for 19 years. And, and you know, starting to meditate 
and um, and starting to um, think more deeply about what does the world really need? Do they need to know about what's going wrong? Yes, I think they do. But there, there is, um, I think, a bigger need to find um, the resilience and the solutions and the sustainability and, you know, stories of hope and love and, and, and compassion. So um, this um, work that I did uh, with Case Western Reserve University, um, starting something called Aim to Flourish, which was the same year that the UN was... Um, putting out its um, sustainable development goals in September. But we knew that it was in the works, that it was going to be translated to all these languages. It was going to be voted on in September. And we said, this is what has to happen in the world by 2030. You know, all of those SDGs in terms of, you know, no poverty and justice and, and gender equality and um, and my personal favorite right, right now is, is really climate action, number 13. All of this needs to happen by 23rd, that we need to be working together collaboratively to build the world that we all want, a world that leaves no one behind, that that works for all. And so we started this with just a a small group of a handful of professors and um, put it out there and started teaching business school students about this, the global goals. Um, In country after country, we would we were using Zoom back there, we would zoom into classrooms and talk about the global goals and send the students out on a journey, on an adventure to do the research, to find a company doing something extraordinary that in some way is trying to achieve one of the SDGs. And the company leader, the CEO might not even know about the SDGs, but they're doing something that in some way is helping, helping to achieve that. I can give you an example if you like, um, we're now up to almost 2,700 stories written by business school students in 80 countries. And we're about to celebrate, every year we celebrate the 17 best, one for each of the global goals and and give out a Flourish Prize. But um, one of the early ones was a, um, a company that was um, producing a little iron fish um, called Lucky Fish in Cambodia. And I've been to Cambodia a couple of times to do stories, and I had no idea that um, a quarter of the population suffers from from uh, iron deficiency, which is a serious health concern. So instead of buying pharmaceuticals and pills and you know whatever to get to take care of their iron deficiency, this little invention of this lucky iron fish, you just put it in your soup pot. You put it in your rice um, when you're making your rice or whatever, and your family gets the iron that they need. And they had peer-reviewed you know, studies of it. It was such a simple, elegant, sort of ground-up, you know, grassroots solution to a big problem that could also, all of these stories need to be both sustainable and also um, something that could be um you know, used in other places that that it could grow, scale scalable, and um, and this is one of those very simple, beautiful creations in Cambodia. Um, another one in, in that I love called Green Hope, which was a company in Indonesia and in Jakarta that was making plastic bags for the supermarkets that would pile up in a landfill for five hundred years. They switched to making them biodegradable in two weeks out of tapioca. And they were supporting the cassava farmers in the process. They had a co-op, they were paying a living wage. I mean, what a beautiful thing, you know, again, to scale up in the world so that we're not using plastic bags in the supermarkets. I mean, so these are very simple sort of untold stories that um, are getting um, a global, people get to see them globally by, you know, looking at the website. You know, the innovation there is wonderful, right? It, it takes a situation which is perceived to be not good at all, something that really is challenging. And it says, wait a minute, in the midst of this, there's something very powerful that can that can happen that's really good. And so, you know, Niall and I have been interviewing people who, you know, are dealing like all of us with the pandemic and, and with understanding how how do we respond to the challenges and even more, how do we see something in this that 
propels us forward in a better way. Uh, do you have thoughts about that? I lie awake at night and think about that. <laughs> um, yes, I'm, I'm thinking all the time about the climate crisis. Um, and, and there is this connection in terms of um, nature and, and, and how we've been disrespectful to nature. And, and so I, at this you know, time of, of great suffering in the world, at least Mother Nature is having a chance to breathe. And humans have learned that, hey, we are kind of trainable, you know, that we can change, change our, um, our habits when we're, when we're pushed. And so I think this forced stillness that we're in right now is an extraordinary opportunity to create the world that we all want. Um, because part of what we need to do in dealing with the climate crisis, and I don't call it climate change, because that does sound like spring is coming. It is a, you know, we're in this crisis, but um, there are solutions and we know what the solutions are and there are things that we can do as individuals. I, um, I have a daughter who has gone vegan specifically because of the climate crisis and going supermarket shopping with her when I was going supermarket shopping with her was not a pleasant experience because it was all like, mom, look at the packaging, look at the transportation involved in bringing that, you know, look at the, you know, is that organic? You know, all those questions that she would teach me to, to think about. I am not vegan, but I've stopped eating red meat. And, um, and that's a huge impact I mean, if we all did simple things like that, it's not only um, helps prevent cancer and heart disease, but it also helps the planet breathe. It's a huge um, contributor to greenhouse gases. When I was flying, which I'm not doing now, I was doing carbon offsets so that I would, and I was very surprised at how inexpensive that was. And there is some controversy about carbon offsets because in a way it's a, it's to assuage your guilt that you're flying all, all over the place. And certainly this forced stillness is teaching me that you don't need to, you know, I, I was supposed to be in New York three times in the last three weeks. Well, the earth is still spinning on its axis without my going to New York, you know, and we, we're meeting this way virtually. And it's not the same but it's having an impact in, um, in, in helping with the climate crisis. And so I feel in some way that we're in a cocoon right now. And in this cocoon, in this forced stillness, we can emerge as beautiful butterflies in terms of thinking about how we want to conduct ourselves. You know, how do we want to address the climate crisis? How do we want to address the chasm, the growing chasm between rich and poor? Um, in, uh, racial inequity, injustice. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, and um, and I think that that people are basically good, and and we're good, and and this is a time of um, of deep education and and um, time to think about how we can change ourselves, our lives, our our leaders, you know, in terms of creating the world we want. Great words. Nyla, maybe you have a question for our guest. It's a very personal question. The way I know Roberta, she has deep spirituality and she tends to bring out the divine spark of humanity with whoever she touches. I would love that she expresses a bit on that side, Roberta. Well, Nyla, um, whenever I talk to you, I do think of the Rumi quote. <laughs> that the beauty you see in me is a reflection of you. You bring that out in people. So um, we tend to go there in terms of, um, yeah, spiritual thinking. Um, actually, I've been very influenced in one of the, um, this initiative that I've been deeply involved in for 19 years, one of the supporting uh, founders of it is an organization called the Brahma Kumaris. And they are, um, it is a, it's a fascinating organization. It's in uh, more than 120 countries. Um, and it is led, it's, it's based in India, in uh, Mount Abu. And in their constitution, and I, I don't remember when the constitution came out, but it was way before the women's lib movement. 
and uh, and and it says that it must be led by women. It's in their constitution, which I find fascinating. Um, this is a uh, they have. They have, you know, men are part of it as well. It's all about service and meditation. Um, they're, they're, um, they practice something called Raj Yoga. And so I am not a Brahma Kumari, but I am a very good friend of the Brahma Kumaris. I use their meditations and I, um, I actually have a sign over on my wall that um, the, the leader of the Brahma Kumaris, Dottie Jenki, um, just passed away at the age of 104, just um, right when the pandemic was coming out. She didn't die of the pandemic, but I, I I believe in my heart that she passed away because she just didn't want to be taking up a bed in a hospital. <laughs> um, she um, had an influence on me in terms of thinking about detachment. And so my my little sign over there, handwritten, just says detachment with a heart. And um, I remind myself about that if I um, get wound up about something that, yeah, you know, it's like just, um, I can be more helpful by not being angry or upset. And so to be in, in a loving place in my heart and, and to experience that compassion. And, um, and I argued with, um, with Dottie Jenke about it. I didn't understand it when she first said that I needed to be detached. I was no, I'm not a detached person at all. I, I'm like, you know, I love the food in front of me. I love my family. I love my friends. I care about my work. And I didn't understand until I was helping um, a very dear friend who was like a second mom um, who was suffering from Alzheimer's. And I was b basically a caregiver in, 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 in that process and found that when I wept with her and got upset with her and all of that, that I was not helpful, that it was so much better if I could be detached from the drama and from the melodrama and the, and, and the, and, and I really taught myself a lot to be sort of in her space. Like when she started talking gibberish, I would talk gibberish with her. You know, I would just be with her in a loving place and we would laugh. And, um, it became a, um, it's a, an experience in my life that that taught me a lot. I am definitely a lifelong learner, not an academic, but um, you know, I've, I'm very grateful for the people that I've crossed paths with, and and um, that working with somebody who has Alzheimer's who you love very much, but can make you a little crazy in the process in terms of the the, the disasters happening detachment was the way that I could be most supportive and loving and, and, and make it as peaceful as possible. Uh, Roberta, you've taught us a lot today and we really appreciate it very much. You know, the Institute is endeavoring to do everything we can to, to bring this, uh, this hopeful message that our ability to empathize and be compassionate can be the beginning of a really important journey for every one of us. So, we thank you for talking about your journey, your thoughts, and uh, if there's anything we can do to help you, please let us know. We really look forward to learning more about how you're doing and, and uh, hope for your success in every one of the endeavors. So thank you so much for being with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation.